Okay, last section. Uh, let's talk about how do you evaluate a forecast? How do you calculate if that forecast is any good or not? Um, so we need to introduce a couple of concepts here. Um, so if you remember, we've got both point forecasts and prediction intervals, and there's different ways to measure the accuracy of both. Um, so let's start with point forecast errors. So we've got a, we've got a zoomed in time series here. Our blue line again is our training data. So that's our real data. That's our ground truth data that we're training our model with. Um, and then we've got our red line, which is our point forecast. So that's synthetic data, if you like. That's something our model has produced for us. Now, what we've done here is something called a train test split or a holdout sample. Um, so actually, we also have this black dot here and that, and that black dot represents um, real data as well. So we've taken our actual data and we've split that data set in two. Um, might be something like 70% um, and 30% or 80% and 20%. Um, and we call that bit, that 20%, the holdout sample or the, or the test set. Um, and we're going we're gonna to produce forecasts of that test set and compare our forecasted values with the actual values. So we can see here, for example, um, at this point I'm, uh, I'm pointing to there, that there is um, a slight difference between the forecasted value and the actual value. And the magnitude of that difference changes depending on uh, what point we are within, within the time series. So we need some way of capturing the general size of the forecast error. Um, and it turns out there are some there are some problems in doing that. So an, an obvious way to do it would just be to take the mean. So if we go back and we calculate the difference of all of these values from their actual values. So we've got a forecast value here and we calculate the difference of that to our actual value. And we do that for all of our points. And then we take the average of those, and that could be the average forecast error. Well, the problem with that is some of the errors are positive and some of the errors are negative. So uh, these kind of average out. So actually your mean error, your average error might look quite small, but some of the errors might be absolutely enormous. Um, but the good news is, so that's, a, that's not a good idea. Basically, that's a bad idea. The good news is there's a, there's a huge number of error me measures we could use um, in place of that mean error. Uh, and some of those are uh, easy to understand, some of them not so easy to understand. Um, so the first thing to do is separate those out into three categories. Um, there's me measures which are called scale dependent, and all that means is the unit of the measure is in the same units as the thing you are trying to measure. So if you're trying to measure the number of toilet rolls sold in the UK um, on a particular month, um, your error measure would also be in units of toilet rolls per month. So you could, for example, take the absolute value of an error, which just means get rid of the negative sign if it is negative. Um, sum all of those up and take the average. And that's called the mean absolute error. And that's a really good measure to use when you're working with um, an individual time series. Um, another way to, to deal with um, negative errors um, is to take the square of them, to so square them, um, and then take the mean of the sum of the squares, and that's called the mean squared error. Um, the units of that will be in whatever units your time series is squared, um, so that's often a little bit confusing to interpret. So what you could do is then take uh, the square root of the mean square error, which is called the root mean squared error, RMSE, and that would be give you a very similar value to your mean absolute error. But what about if you need to talk to um, a decision maker who's perhaps not uh, as familiar with the data, or if you need to compare um, the rate of error across multiple time series or across um, different types of time series. So we can bring in a relative error measure here um, as, as one option. 
and uh, one of the um, one of the famous ones of these is called MAPE, mean absolute percentage error. Um, so here you're just looking at, so it's very similar to mean absolute error, so you're looking at the absolute out values again, but you're looking at what their percentage difference is from the actual value, and then you just take the mean of those. So you would say something like my, uh, the error of my uh, forecasting model is 10% or 5%, which is, which is quite intuitive. Um, there's a few issues with that. Uh, so if your data contains zeros or values very close to zero, um, it means that your MAPE can suddenly become very big indeed. It can, be, it can inflate. It's also not a symmetric measure. So if on average you're 50 above versus 50 below, um, it will, the, the mean absolute percentage error will look different. It will be a different value. And in fact, if you optimize around MAPE, you'll tend to produce a model which under forecasts, so tends to produce values which are lower than the actual value. So there's been some uh, effort to try and deal with that. So a more complicated version of MAPE, which is quite confusing, is called symmetric MAPE. So that tries to get rid, rid of that symmetry problem of um, bigger uh, positive errors um, being inflated over negative errors. Um, but that doesn't work very well um, in practice. And uh, in some ways, it's better to use MAPE because it's a simpler measure to understand. Um, so what's been introduced um, in recent years are, are what are called scaled scaled errors. So an example of that is mean absolute scaled error MACE. Um, so what MACE is doing is it's taking the mean absolute error of your forecast and it's scaling that by um, a, a naive method. So it would scale it, for example, by um, seasonal naive or naive one. And that just means dividing by it. So what we'll tend to focus on are the simpler measures today. But it's uh, the thing to take away is there's um, there's a range of error measures you can use um, within uh, forecast accuracy for point forecast. This is just the tip of literally the tip of the iceberg. These tend to be the most popular ones. So what about prediction interval coverage? Well, let's go back to our picture of um, a holdout sample. Um, so we can see that some of these points fall within prediction interval, our yellow and pink shaded regions, and some of them don't. Um, so if you had all of them within a, uh, a prediction interval and you guaranteed you would always get all of them within it, that's a 100% prediction interval. And that would be very wide um, and not very useful. Um, so what we really want is uh, good coverage um, that, and coverage that lines up with the probability that we're trying to guarantee. So for example, with an 80% prediction interval, ideally we would want around 80% of the points we forecast to fall within that interval. And that would give us confidence that when we produce our forecasts for real, remember this is a simulated forecast with a train test split, when we produce our forecasts for real, we would be getting around 80% coverage. And the same for 95%. So it turns out in practice, this is, this is quite difficult to do. Um, so it's really important that, uh, well, what I mean by that, first of all, is it's really difficult to get an 80% prediction interval to contain exactly 80% of the points or around 80%. Um, typically it's less or it's way more because your model, your model isn't, is either so inaccurate, it's, it's completely useless, or it might have good point forecast, but it's not, its prediction intervals aren't quite wide enough. So what we need to do is a rigorous evaluation of our models to try and understand if it's producing the right level of uncertainty. And that's really about knowing the limitations of the tools that you are using for your forecasting. So to add a little bit more complication, we're gonna talk about cross validation. Um, so, Flip back a second. So what we have here is a train test split, but that's only one train test split. So all we've done is we've taken our data and we've held out 30 or 20% of it. And we've used that to check um, how good is our model at forecasting that data. But that's only one data point, really. We only know how good it was that once. Um, so one option is to go a bit further and use something called cross-validation. So cross-validation is about 
running your uh, train test split multiple times. Um, and that means we get um, a data set rather than a single data point. Um, so we have a data set of forecast errors and that can give us much more information about how we might expect our model to perform in practice. So uh, I'm going to try and talk you through this now and I'm going to talk you through an approach to cross-validation called rolling, uh, rolling forecast origin or a rolling origin forecast. So here we've got 12 data points um, labelled 1 through 12. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to gradually uh, introduce more data into our model and predict into the future. So our initial training set is points 1 to 5, and we're going to predict points 6 and 7. So we're going to forecast two time periods into the future. But we've actually held back points 6 through 12. So what this means is that we can do what's called a cross-validation fold. So in our first fold, we train our model on the blue data, that's points 1 through 5, and we predict the red data, point 6 and 7. And then the purple data, point 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, is held out. We don't do anything with that. So in our first fold, we predict point 6 and 7 off points 1 to 5, and we produce a forecast error. And we add that to our data set. Then we run a second fold. This time, we roll the forecast origin forward into the future. So we now train our model on points 1 through 6, and we predict points 7 and 8. And then points 9 through 12, we hold out and we don't do anything with. So now we've got two data points that we've added to our data set. We run this rolling forecast origin process again. And now we train our model on points 1 through 7. And we predict points 8 and 9. And that gives us a third data point. And we go on. And then with this data set, we can actually run six folds of our data. So instead of having that single train test split, where we get one data point, really, about, how, about our four point forecast error and our prediction coverage, we've now got six. So that's much more useful. Um, but you'll need to think carefully about how big should our initial training set be and what is our forecast origin. And, and that will affect how many folds you can run. If you could run something like five to ten folds, that would be very useful for, the, for doing this in practice. So that's the end of the first lecture. Um, we're now going to take a, um, a look at how you would start to bring time series data into Python, um, how you would visualise it, um, and how you would produce some very simple benchmark forecasts.